This is the Your Kick Ass Life podcast, episode number 94. All links and resources you hear in this podcast can be found by going to yourkickasslife.com forward slash 94. This is the Your Kick Ass Life podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self help and badassery. Because, ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host. The girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. Welcome to another edition of the podcast. As always, I'm so happy you're here and that I get to spend some time with you. This is the first of, uh, hopefully it works and we like it. And what I'm going to be doing is answering your questions. It is quite simply, listener Q&A time. A few weeks back, I asked you to send me your questions, and you did. And I was so happy to be able to have an opportunity to answer some of the burning questions that you have in your life. I'm going to answer three of them. I'm answering them in the order that they came in. So if you sent in a question and I didn't get to it, I will get to it the next round that I do this. I don't know, probably in a month or so. So please be patient. And if you do have a question that you would like answered, shoot us an email at support at yourkickasslife.com. We do not have to use your name. I can if you want, but please give as much information in your question as possible. And please don't apologize for writing a long email or rambling or anything like that. Your story is your story, and I'm happy to read it, and I'm happy to answer your questions because your questions help other people. So please know that when when you're asking questions and I'm answering them here, you are being of service to others. Before I get into the first question, there is a series of three of them, and I wanted to let you know that right now we are open for registration for my co Um, I've co-created a class with my best friend and and, and colleague, Amy Smith. It's called the Self-Love Revolution, and we sell a program called the Master's Course, and we created a home study version of it, so you can do it at your own pace, you can do it in the privacy of your own home, and you can have the materials forever, and it's really amazing, if I do say so myself. We cover four main topics of self-love. We've actually taught this program since 2012, I think, and this past fall, we scrapped the materials and started over because we have noticed some main topics that people typically need help with in regards to self-love. So that is self-kindness and self-compassion, something I love to talk about here on the podcast and everywhere, given a platform to do so. You know, that's also the inner critic. We also go over self-worth, which is closely related to what I just mentioned. We talk about forgiveness, huge topic of self-love. And then the last module, we go over emotions, which actually has kind of been a theme over here, hasn't it? About feeling your feelings and, and things like that. So that's the what it covers. And go on, go on over to the selfloverevolution.com. There are bonuses that drop off today, Wednesday. So get on it, girls. There is a there's several bonuses. One of them is a live QA call with Amy and myself. It's it's affordable. It's under a hundred bucks. So get your booty on the dance floor. I mean get your booty on over to the selfloverevolution.com to check that out. So let's get into the very first question, shall we? <laughs> All right, so the first question comes from a lovely ass kicker named Sarah, and she says, my question is, how do I deal with in-laws that I don't trust? My in-laws live several hundred miles away, so I only see them three to four times a year, but whenever I have to see or talk to them, I feel very anxious, tense, and guarded. My experience with them has shown that whatever I say or do is closely scrutinized. I have to defend everything I say or do when I'm with them. As a result, I reveal as little of myself as I can. I feel like I'm hiding behind a shield of fabricated blandness. It feels gross and exhausting. I don't trust that they love me unconditionally, and I don't trust that they have my back. How do I maintain this relationship without all the anxiety and inauthentic posturing? I don't feel safe to let my guard down, but I hate the way this relationship feels and the stress it causes me. So this is a great question because maybe you're listening and maybe you don't have in-laws that you feel this way, but maybe it's um, a sibling. Maybe it's 
uh, coworkers that you have to hang around. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's someone in your life where you feel like Sarah does. So the first thing that jumped out at me as I read her question and, you know, if she were standing in front of me, the qu- first question I would ask is, what are the expectations you have of this relationship? So she said, I don't trust that they love me unconditionally, and I don't trust that they have my back. And I'm wondering, is that their job? Like, should they? Do they have to? Are they supposed to? Like, your parents? Yes. I think that that is kind of their job as your parents. But these aren't your parents. My question to you is, Have you made up some fantasy of what that relationship is supposed to look like? Or are you maybe comparing your relationship to your in-laws to somebody else's relationship with their in-laws? Maybe you have a friend or your sister has like an amazing relationship with their in-laws and you don't. Just because you love their son doesn't mean that you're meant to have chemistry with them and love them too. Just because you're married to their child doesn't mean that automatically it's going to be this great relationship with them. Like, does it suck? Yeah. But I, I, my first question is to, I'm really curious if you're making up a story about what it's supposed to look like and you're banking on that and it's, you have this expectation. Do you guys remember when I had Christine Hassler on of expectation hangover? This is what she would call an expectation hangover. So that was episode 58. So if you go to yourkickasslife.com forward slash 58, you can listen to that episode that I had with Christine. And I think very much so that that might be what is happening here. So my question is, how invested are you in this relationship? In other words, how much time and energy are you willing to put in? Because that really does change everything. And really think about that. And I wouldn't want you to answer that from a place of should. Well, I should put in all this time and energy because they're my in-laws or because it's important to my partner or because it's, you know, because that would make me a good daughter-in-law. Like, no, really. Like, how, how, how much are you invested in this relationship? How much time and energy are you willing to put in? And a quick side note, I don't know based on your question what your husband thinks of this, if you've talked to him about it, if he defends them, if he says you're making it up, whatever. Regardless, this puts him in a weird place. So I wouldn't put too much of the hope of you having a better relationship with your in-laws. I wouldn't put too much of that on him because I... I make up over here that it just puts him in a tricky position. So again, just a little side note, side note about that. But you do have choices here. You have the choice to do nothing at all. And it's likely nothing will change or it might even get worse or have a conversation with them about it. So if you decide to do a conversation, to have a conversation with them, it would not at all be blaming and telling them all the things you feel like they're doing to make you feel uncomfortable, but it would be about telling them what you're making up. So it would basically be the things that you wrote in the question to me, that that's that's how you're feeling and ask them what they think of it. So it might sound like I'm making up that you feel blank about me. What do you think about that? You know, is this true? This will, if you decide to do that, this will be one of the hardest conversations probably of your life. And obviously you don't have to do it. If you're listening to this and you're like, oh my God, no, never in a million years. So, okay, then you are going to choose the choice to probably do nothing at all. If you did have the conversation with you, they might be honest and tell you how they feel about you. And that might be hurtful. Or they could be honest and tell you that you're making making it all up and they love you and adore you. Or they could lie and say that they love you and it continues to be weird. I mean, you just don't know. The sucky part is that you have no control over what they'll say or feel or whatever, and you can't be attached to it working out in your favor. You can want what you want. I mean, always give yourself permission to want what you want, but I caution you not to put your happiness on the outcome being in your favor. And But I, I keep coming back to the notion that you don't have to see them that often So what if you could just chalk it up to it being a surface relationship? Like, would that take the anxiety down a notch for you? You only talk about surface topics like the weather, home decorating, and hobbies. You don't reveal much of yourself because 
They aren't the people in your life that have earned the right to know you inside and out. I think so many people listening need to realize that. Just because you're married to their son doesn't mean they've earned the right automatically for you to show them your heart and have this awesome, loving, connected relationship. Like, wouldn't it be awesome if it was like that? Yes, it would be awesome if it was like that, but it's not. And it doesn't mean anything about you as a human. It doesn't mean anything about your marriage. All it means is that they have something going on. They are making up stuff about you. And that's it. That's really it. You know, the really good news is that you only have to see them three or four times a year. Like, that's kind of awesome. Imagine if they lived across the street or something like that. So what I want to leave you with is what do you ask yourself? Like, what do you need to do to take care of you? Instead of focusing on them, because I think that that's what's happening and that's what's causing the anxiety is like all the stuff you're making up about why, possibly why they don't like, you don't even know if they don't like you. I mean, who knows? You have no idea unless you ask them, which like I said, you have the choice to talk to them about it. But instead of focusing on them and blaming them for making you feel gross, what if you shifted the focus on taking care of yourself? It also sounds to me like you're putting some of your self-worth on if they like you or not. And if you are, that is definitely something to think about and do some work on self-worth and just, and it's about separating that because there's no prerequisites for worthiness. You guys, I say that all the time, but their opinion of you is only for them. It really doesn't mean anything about you. So hopefully that helps Sarah. And, uh, thanks for asking that question and being brave. And we are on to question two. Alrighty, this next question comes from a listener named Amy, and she says, I have been doing a lot of work on my inner critic. Every time I start to let her come out, I write down everything she says and then flip the paper over to write what I would tell a friend if they told me that stuff. I haven't done it in a while, but have become more aware of the thoughts and more able to switch the thoughts. I'm super proud of this. Can I stop for a moment and just applause and like jump up and down screaming how excited I am to hear that. I I assume and maybe I'm just being um really just not humble at all, but I assume that you learned that from the 7 day challenge or from my Gremlin e-course or one of my classes and it's just one of the many tools I have and I'm so proud of you for doing the work, you guys. Tools, they work. Got to do it. Got to do the work. So all right, enough of that excitement. Getting back to her question, she said, but I have started to neutralize myself. Like I don't feel anything. I'm not sure where to go from here. Sometimes I feel bad for not being such a worrier. I'm not feeling the emotions the way I want. I'm missing out on true joy. I'm scared if I feel more then all the bad will rush back in. Yes, I don't feel as miserable, but I don't feel happiness either. What are some tools to get over this numbing? Again, so first, girl, kudos for doing the work. This is your natural progression. This is your natural journey, and I'm so glad to hear that you're actually seeing and you're aware of what's happening because, I mean, you could have just started to do the work on your inner critic and stopped there and just been like, okay, so I guess this is as good as it gets. I'm just going to kind of go through life in this weird sort of floating non-emotional state of being. So I just, I want you to pat yourself on the back for that. And yes, you know, you're not exactly where you want to be, but this is part of the work. This is part of life and learning. So you were a certain way for a very long time. And I'm, I'm guessing that you're somewhere between the age of like 25 and 65. So regardless, you were a certain way with your thoughts and feelings for a long time and you're shifting out of that. So What I see a lot in the women that I work with is they come ready, you know, like bells on. And then they're like, all right, I'm ready to totally change the way that I think and feel and am. (laughs) Can we do this in like a month? And I'm the same way. Like I'm the same way. I want things to happen fast, but that's really not how it works. So I just, that was a really long way of saying, congratulations, you're doing the work and be patient. The second thing that I want to say is 
is to really ask you, what are you doing, if anything, to actually numb your feelings? So is there a case of excessive drinking or too much exercise or working too much, internet, Netflix, being busy? I mean, numbing isn't necessarily fall down drunk every night or binge eating three pizzas in an hour. Numbing is the unconscious behavior of doing something else when feelings arise so we don't have to feel them. And typically, we don't know it's happening. If you know that some of your go, if you know what some of your go-to behaviors are, it's easier to pinpoint when it's happening. But, however, comma, I found sometimes people don't do an actual behavior. So I'm raising my hand over here because personally, I've stopped my go-to behaviors. And I've gotten so good at numbing, I can push emotions aside and go on about my day. Like, I don't even, I don't need to drink anymore. (laughs) I I mean, it's funny. I, I, I got it pointed out to me recently. I was working with my coach. Her name's Lisa. And she, I was talking about a really sensitive topic and you know, she's asking me all the powerful questions that coaches do. And it was kind of more of like a processing, we call it process coaching. And there was a, there was two or three times during our hour together where she asked me a question. And like, I felt that like, no, you know, like throat tightening, eyes welling with tears. And I shut it down so fast. And she pointed it out because we, we video Skype and she was like, all right, there's been like two times where you've gone over into feeling and, you know, looking like emotional about what we're talking about and you shut it down. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like a master at that. So I wonder if that's happening for you. Like, in other words, it's not necessarily that you are drinking too much or shopping like crazy or anything like that, or, you know, numbing out on Facebook, but it's actually, you've just gotten really good at shutting it down. So you know, this also doesn't always happen with like the harder emotions like sadness or grief or disappointment and things like that. Because you mentioned in your question about joy. I mean, and again, another personal example, when I had my book signing in 2013, I mean, it's like a dream come true moment. There I am at Barnes and Noble in my hometown in San Diego. And like people, like my childhood friends, my high school best friends, like all of my favorite people in the world are coming to congratulate me and celebrate in this moment. And Amy, my best friend, was with me and she was like, I would expect you to be more excited about this. And I was like, this is so fucking uncomfortable for me right now. I don't even know how to act. Like I want to crawl out of my skin. It was so much happiness and so much joy in such a dream come true moment. I was like, oh my God, like I can't. I felt like raw, like don't touch me. (laughs) It's gonna hurt and be painful. So like, I get it. I totally get it. And that for me and some of my, my clients is really about knowing that it's happening. And that is totally the first step because I think that, you know, if you're anything like me and any of you listening, we have been this way for a really long time again. And it's, it's not a matter of just like, all right, I want you to feel all this joy and like emote like your best friend does. And, you know, cause we do that. Like we compare, you know, I compare myself to the way my best friend Amy emotes. Like she's really good at showing and expressing her feelings and emotions. I am not. It's still like a work in progress for me. And like, Trust me, I have gotten a lot better. I'm way less stoic and way less resting bitch, bitch face all the time. So, but in the meantime, you know, it's it's definitely like a progression. It's not just going to take me like a month. So that's what I want you to think about too, Amy, is, is just where you might be making up, like what it needs to look like. And are you kind of beating yourself up for that? So again, just be kind to yourself. This is unlearning what you've known for possibly ever. So it's going to take a minute to learn a new way. There's a quote by um, two women that wrote a book on um, intuitive eating, and I've got to get their names because it's like one of my favorite quotes right now. And they said, be gentle. You're meeting parts of yourself that you've been at war with. 
pretty profound, right? So in those moments, just try to notice. And another thing, like I was kind of saying before, people emote differently. I have a girlfriend who cries all the time. And I I love that about her. And I just don't think that I emote that way. And maybe you don't either. And quite honestly, like the old me, when I first met her, this girl that I'm talking about, like I wasn't really like comfortable even around people like that. So it's just, again, it's like this natural progression that's going to be as it's going to be. So I'm, I mean, I can tell that you've made a lot of progress already just by working on your inner critic. So a tool for that is to get creative. Have you read um, Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert? And I have to admit, I have not read the whole thing. I've just read bits and pieces. But I, I am a full believer in creativity and I'm a full believer that creativity helps us be with and deal with our emotions. So I know when I've been stuffing emotions, I write about it. It always gets the tears flowing. For me, I don't even know how to express what's happening. Like I can't even wrap my head around it until it comes out on the page. And you might not, you you know, some of you listening might be like, well, I'm not an author. It's like, I really don't give a shit. You don't have to be an author. But journal, anyone can journal. Anyone can get out a piece of paper and start writing about what's going on. You could open up your computer and start typing about what's going on. And if you don't know where to start, type that. I can't even tell you how many of my journal entries have started with, I don't know where to start, but I guess I'll start at the beginning. And whatever feeling is like cropping up, like, are you pissed about something that you should be happy about? Are you resentful about something that you're supposed to feel joy about? Or are you resentful about somebody that you love who's been like amazing to you? And you're kind of like, they're bugging you. You know, it's like things like that. It's just anything, absolutely anything that is coming up. Even if it's just like, if, even if it doesn't make any sense to you, start writing it down. Maybe you write songs or poetry or sing sad songs. I mean, damn, put some, put on some Adele. Like that, that can get anybody in the mood to like start writing about your feelings because we all know she's writing about us, right? Whatever creative outlet you have. What's also really helpful is for some people is to say the emotion out loud. I learned that from my friend, Martha Atkins, who's actually coming up on next week's podcast episode. You have to listen to it. It's so good. And it seems really silly and simple, and maybe that's what it needs to be, but you just say the emotion out loud. So if you feel like an ink, like Adele comes on and you're like, this makes me really sad. That's it. (laughs) There's nothing like scientific about it. And, you know, you don't have to say it out loud, but just like say it to yourself. Like this, this moment, I think brings me a lot of joy, you know, just like simple moments. I always feel like the most joyous moments are just like the simple, tiny moments of our life. They, they aren't, you know, I don't know. They don't have to be big and giant. So in regards to, to speaking of joy, so please, please, please go to podcast number 80 and listen to it in its entirety. It's yourkickasslife.com forward slash 80. And anything, any links that I'm throwing at you, you guys are in the show notes for this podcast. So yourkickasslife.com forward slash 94 is where all of these links are going to be housed. If you're like, oh, I want to listen to Christine's episode and, and all the other ones. So specifically your question, Amy, around not being able to feel feel joy. I wrote a, I wrote and did a podcast specifically on this. So in that episode I talk about leaning into joy and how difficult it is for so many. I mean, Brené Brown told us in her research that and it was sort of surprising to her that joy is the emotion that people find the hardest to feel. Cuz to sit with that is so uncomfortable and we avoid it altogether. We're afraid it's going to go away. I mean, that's catastrophizing. We rehearse tragedy. Because we know what it feels like to be disappointed. We know what it feels like to feel sad and grief and have expectations that don't go our way. We know that very well. So we set ourselves up so the fall won't be as bad. So that's what that whole episode is is about. And I invite you to, to go and listen to that. So one last thing that you might be making up. Some people are afraid to feel and express emotion because they're afraid they won't come out of it on the other end. So I've heard before, if I start crying, will I ever stop? If I start grieving, will I ever stop grieving? Will I ever feel happy again? 
That's a common fear. And if you feel that way, you're not alone. And I can assure you that you'll come out. But that's why it's so important for you to have those people in your life who can hear your stories. And I have a specific blog post. It's not a podcast episode. You will have to read it, not listen to it. But it's in the show notes at yourkickasslife.com forward slash 94. And the title of it is important thing, um, the most important thing happy women have. And I'll just tell you, <laughs> it's a support system. It's it's like that one person, two if you're really lucky, but that one person that can hear your story and be a, a soft place to land for you and just to hear about, you know, just to, to witness your crying and your grieving. The people that you've built a trusting relationship with that can bear the weight of your pain. So thanks for asking that question, Amy. That was a really brave one. And I, again, so happy to hear that you're doing the work. And on to our last question. All right, this one comes from a listener named Autumn. And she says, not long before I found you, I decided to, to divorce my husband as my son deserves the opportunity for two happy homes instead of one unhappy one. Co-parenting is the toughest thing I have ever done. My son also has autism. His dad and I have separate ideas of what our son needs. Reading Brene's chapter on wholehearted parenting helped me see that I engage in the comparison of who is the better parent. Unfortunately, his dad has absolutely no interest in trying to co-parent or get additional services for our son. I feel that I can't do enough to help him, while at the same time reassuring that he is good enough as he is. I know I'm not the only parent with 50-50 joint custody of a child where the parents are unable to communicate and discuss the best interests of the child, let alone one with special needs. What I'm looking for is someone else who has had similar struggles or a way to figure out how I can do the best that I can that I can do while accepting that his dad might be doing the same. What I don't want is to put my son through the court system so I can have full custody thinking that I am the better parent. So I almost didn't answer this question because I thought, well, I am definitely not a co-parenting expert because I, my husband and I, we do have a son with autism, but we are in a marriage and I thought, you know what, though, I do have some things to say about that, because more specifically about just getting services in general for uh, for autism. So first thing, get support from your local autism chapter. All you have to do is Google autism resources and then put your state in and then you can your state probably has a chapter and then they break it down by city. There's a lot of different uh, like autism society and chapter and like, and, you know, they're all named different things, but, um, you can also ask the local school district if they have resources, even if your son isn't in school yet, school yet, most cities have parent support groups. I mean, for instance, my city has even like a mom's night out. There's meetups. They have like special stuff for autistic kids to do. And here's the thing. This may take a bit of pounding the pavement and reaching some dead ends. I know when I lived in the state of Utah, where my son was first diagnosed, it was a bitch. Like, to be honest with you, the resources weren't that great. It was like pulling teeth for me to find any kind of like parent resources or things like that. And every state is different. But uh, we also moved before I did more research. So keep trying. (laughs) Even when you reach dead ends, keep trying. And, and really the easiest way to find this is online. So look for groups on Facebook that have different, um, you know, you can just, you can do a search on Facebook for groups and then just click on groups and then you ask to join. And then, you know, some of them might not be right. And then others are. So those will both, they will both be able to support you in getting resources for him and also for the personal and emotional type of stuff. So I have found online resources to be invaluable. So getting to the topic of your ex-husband, there is a a quote in 12-step programs that I I take a lot away from 12-step programs. So and they say, keep your side of the street clean. This is especially hard when you really like to control other people's streets as much as I do. I can tell you this is going to possibly be the hardest challenge of your life, maybe. On the upside, since you said he's not interested in getting services for your son, 
hopefully you don't have to argue with him about it. You know, I'm just kind of trying to look at the bright side a little bit. Maybe you can just be able to do it. It might very well work out in your favor. And I can tell you something, just a side note about services. We've done several different things with our son and it's hard to tell what's worked and what hasn't. So I suppose it's just the nature of the beast and we keep trying and so many people will give you their opinion on what they think is helpful. And there really are in 2016, so many services for, for kids with special needs these days. It's kind of amazing. So we're lucky that they're born in this generation and, and really just follow your gut as far as that. That's just a little side note I wanted to tell you. But what jumped out at me in reading your question is that I think much of the work for you will be self-compassion for yourself. You will compare your parenting to your ex-husband's parenting. You probably will sometimes think that you're the better parent. So I don't think it's a matter of the goal being to stop doing that altogether. I think the goal and the win is just to notice when you're thinking it and move on. Try not to let it make you angry or resentful or make you make decisions based on those comparisons and judgments. And like, yeah, you're going to feel whatever you feel, but I want you to just notice when it's happening and don't let it sweep you away like for an entire week is what I'm trying to say. Feel what you feel, but try your best to put a container around it. And again, this goes back to the previous question I just answered about who are the people in your life that can hear you and hear your stories about that. If you need to vent about your ex-husband, if you need to be really upset about something that's happening, like I tell you what, I have never needed more support from my best friends and and that when it comes to my son and dealing with the challenges of, of having a special needs child. And I also think a lot of this work for you is figuring out what battles you're willing to fight versus what you need to surrender to and let go of and what boundaries you need to set. Uh, There is a video that was put out not too long ago. That'll be in the show notes to yourkickasslife.com forward slash 94 about it's Brene talking about boundaries and how in her research, she has found some of the most compassionate people that she knows are the most boundaried. So I think often we make up that like boundaries are for like hard ass people and just like meanies. And that's actually not true. I've also did an interview with Randy Buckley, who's amazing in regards to boundaries. And we talk all about boundaries in that episode. So if anyone needs help with that, it's episode 52. So yourkickasslife.com forward slash 52 for Randy's episode. I know if it were me, I would have to check myself where I would get self-righteous. So be mindful of when you are arguing for the sake of being right, being indignant and calling it standing up for yourself when in your gut you know that you should let it go. Like raise your hand if you've ever done that. Like holy shit, I have. This happened to me just last year. So like when you're arguing and you're like, this probably isn't a battle worth fighting. (laughs) I should probably let it go, but it's like self-righteous, like just takes over and you're like, no, I am not giving up on this argument. I am, I'm digging my heels in and I am not stopping. So I think a lot of self-love and compassion for yourself and for other people is about knowing when to just let it go. And I think, I don't know, personally, sometimes like my inner critic is like, oh no, that's giving up. That's, that's weakness. That's because that's vulnerable is what it is. It is vulnerable act to actually say, put your hands up and just be like, I'm done. And this is not worth it to me. It is absolutely not worth it to me. That's brave. Like, I feel like it takes more courage to actually just surrender and just be like, I'm done having this argument with you. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm out. That takes more courage than to keep arguing for the sake of arguing and trying to be right. Who's with me there, right? So that's just me personally. I don't know. You may be absolutely not like me and never get like that ever, ever. So hopefully that really helps. And just to to quickly summarize, Autumn, it's about self-compassion. It's about boundaries. And it's about support. You, if I had to like put an emphasis on any of those, bold any of them, it is about support. I truly think that 
self-compassion and boundaries are reliant on how much support you have. So that is what I would keep the focus on absolutely positively faux show. So that wraps it up, you guys. This was so fun. I love being able to answer your questions. So please shoot us an email, support at yourkickasslife.com if you have a question that you would like answered on listener Q&A. And we will let you know if we are going to to air it and when it's going to come out. So I love it, adore you. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget to run over to the selfloverevolution.com if you are interested in getting that home study course that I talked about in the beginning of the program. And until next time, I will see you out in cyberspace. Bye-bye.